Good morning, <laughs> and welcome to the service of worship at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson. For those of you who don't know, my name is Reverend Bethany Russell Lowe, and I have the great pleasure and honor of serving as your minister. Our community is as varied as the blooms of the Sonoran Desert. Whoever you are, whoever you have been, and whoever you are on the path to becoming, I welcome you, I invite you bring your whole self here and now. We are a covenantal community, which means that we make promises about how we are together when we are together. And in these times of pandemic, wearing masks, except when speaking one person from here, um, practicing some degree of social distancing, maybe dictated by the buttons people are wearing, and getting vaccinated are all part of our covenant with each other. If you are attending worship here in person this morning, our hope is that you stay in covenant with us by being vaccinated. And if you are not, um, we hope that you will join us online next week. I extend a special welcome to any visitors and invite you to fill out a guest information card. If you're joining us on YouTube, our administrator, Mary Weiss, will drop a link to that guest information card in the chat right now. If you're here in person, there are clipboards with yellow pieces of paper on them by the piano. We will meet for social hour right after the service, both on Zoom and out on the patio through the doors you came in. And Mary will post the Zoom link to Zoom social hour in the YouTube chat close to the end of the service. Today, we are lucky to have a guest pianist, Hang Bai, 
Hong Yu is a doctoral student at U of A. Let's welcome Hong Yu. And this morning is Easter, one of the holiest days for Christians. And Friday night was the beginning of the eight day celebration of Passover, one of the holiest, some of the holiest days for Jewish people. As a Unitarian Universalist community, we acknowledge all of these as holy days. And as individuals, we have varying practices and sometimes no practice at all associated with any given holy day. So today, in this hour, we are recognizing both Easter and Passover, and I'll also recognize the month of Ramadan that we are currently in, Muslim society in. And in our service, we are leaning into what our Unitarian Universalist theology calls us to. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Call to worship words this morning come from Reverend M. Barclay, Reverend Ford, and Flesh, with a modern spin on the meaning of Easter. Keep your proclamations of grandeur. Give me East, an Easter as small as a seed, one that can be planted while it is still cold outside, one that can be watered with tears and demands time and patience to grow. I don't need to know how large it will become, how long it will blossom, or even if it will be pretty. I only want it to grow roots that dig deep down, striving for life in the underbelly of the world. Spare me the cosmic promises of otherworldly escape and point me to the sacred possibilities within reach. 
tell me again about how the nutrients born from decay keep even the saddest places brimming with potential for life. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Thank you. My name is Betsy McMillan and I'm the worship associate today. If you're joining us on YouTube and have a candle or chalice nearby. I invite you to light it at the end of these chalice lighting words, and I invite everyone to read our chalice lighting words from Reverend Leslie Takahashi. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create, a deeper peace of our love a more embracing hope, of a deeper joy in this life we share. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure why the video is not playing. Here it comes. We're hoping for sound. Yay. Oh, my God. 
Happy Easter. Where do we start the Easter story? For us, it is with the fact that Jesus was a wise and radical teacher. Wait, no, not that kind of teacher. This teacher, he had a group of loyal and loving followers. His teachings were about love and kindness. Then he was put to death, executed by his government for his religious ideas. That was the sad part. After he died, he was put in a tomb and his followers were grief stricken. However, that day was the Sabbath, the day of rest, so they couldn't attend to him until the next day. And then when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on, on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look. There is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, so they were afraid. And all that had been commanded to them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Now, as those of us familiar with the Bible might have guessed, there is much controversy in how the story ends. Some authorities say it should end here. Others add a longer ending of Mark. Though it is known as early as the late second century common era, the longer ending is missing from the earliest, most reliable Greek manuscripts and seems to mix motifs and phrases from the other gospels. One can wonder whether this longer ending is really Mark or even a ghostwriter, but here it is, let's listen to it. Now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Later, he appeared to the leaven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. And to the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. But the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that had accompanied it. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jamili, for um, the uh, Easter story. Our earth is strong. It can hold our pain and our joy, our love and our anger. Our shared bowl, which we use for joys and concerns each week, is strong enough to hold the big rocks, our collective celebrations and mornings, and also the smaller stones that will be added to signify our individual joys and sorrows. A joy that I have today is to 
see each of you here again and to be with you and to also be with each of you at home for the first time for an Easter in two years. We who live in the desert know that water is a life-sustaining and scarce resource. Let us remember the desert people who came here in the first place. We honor the Hohokam, the Yavapai, the Tohono O'odham, the Yaki, and the people who no longer exist as tribal entities here in Arizona. A couple of days ago, I heard on the news that in, in 2021, there was a record 226 human remains recovered from our desert. And this year we're already at 42 so far who've died in crossing. We pour water from a plastic jug similar to the ones used by those seeking to assure access to water in the desert like our ministry partner, No More Deaths. We will again be using menti com m e n t i dot com to collect your joys and sorrows. If you have something you'd like to share with us, please go to m e n t i dot com and put in the code nine one zero eight five one zero six. It's up on the screen. Those instructions have appeared. And if you can't access menti.com, you can, if you're here, you can go to Brian Moon and he can type it for you. If you're here in person, we welcome you to come up to the table and put a stone in the water to symbolize your joy or sorrow. The pebbles create ripples of hope.
we can get that Mentimeter up, I will read out your responses. We are holding joy for live music and theater back in Tucson. Amen. We'll hear some live music from the choir today. Click again. Thank you. Grateful for warm welcome, shared stories, and new beginnings. Looking forward to hiding dog treats for today's Easter egg hunt for my kids and pets. That is wonderful. <laughs> My mother is finally getting away from her old life and breaking cycles. I am so very proud of her. Oh, prayers for your mother as she navigates that. Remembering Fran and Patricia who have both passed this month. Prayers of love for all who love them. I've just received a full-time job offer. Yay! And now need to secure housing. Mm -hmm. The excitement of a young child for the Easter rituals of eggs and baskets. Yes. Yes. My sister needs more guidance in her life, and I hope she realizes she has me. Oh, she is held. Glad so many singers sang on live, online. Glad so many are here to sing in person. Amen. I'm struggling with having my voice quieted by the institution at work for speaking out against the very real racism and oppression our most vulnerable communities face each day. How can one have faith in the system progressing after that? Ooh. Grateful for the Ocotillo blooms. Me too. Marion Leonard says, thank you. Thank you, Jim. My dear wife, Joni, is in the hospital and very sick. Please hold her in the light of your loving thoughts and wishes. We are holding you and sending you light and love, Joni. In honor of the Jewish holy day of Passover this week, our words for prayer this morning come from Rabbi Brant Rosen. Please join me now in a moment of meditation or prayer, whatever is your own way of centering down, focusing in. Your child will ask, why do we observe this festival? And you will answer, it is because of what God did for us and we, when we were set free from the land of Egypt. Your child will ask, were we set free from the land of Egypt that we might hold tightly to the pain of our enslavement with a mighty hand? And you will answer, we, will, we, we were set free from Egypt that we might release our pain by reaching with an outstretched arm to all who struggle for freedom. Your child will ask, were we set free from the land of Egypt because we are God's chosen people? And you will answer, we were set free from the land of Egypt so that we will finally come to learn all who are oppressed are God's chosen. Your child will ask, were we set free from the land of Egypt that we might conquer and settle a land inhabited by others? And you will answer, we were set free from the land of Egypt that we might open wide the doors to proclaim, let all who are dispossessed return home. Let all who wander find welcome at the table. Let all who hunger for liberation come and eat. Amen. Blessed be. And I invite you to continue with me on the spirit of centering, because we are now going to hear a song that is inspired by the Passover story with a different lens. Let My People Go from our great hymnals is an African-American spiritual written by people who were enslaved in the Americas and who became familiar with this story through the religion of their enslavers. For the enslaved persons living in the Americas, the Passover story was personal. 
They, too, were living under tyrannical rule. Theirs was the tyrannical rule of slave masters and an economy that depended upon cheap and free labor. And as these enslaved persons heard how God led the Israelites out of Egypt to their freedom, a hope grew in them that they, too, would one day be free from the tyranny of chattel slavery. We will hear a refrain in this song, let my people go. Imagine with me the prophetic power of enslaved persons singing over and over again, subverting the religious stories of their oppressors to imagine their own liberation and freedom. Let my people go. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. The Lord told Moses what to do, let my people go. Lead the tribe of Israel through. Let my people go. Go down, Moses. Way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh. Let my people go. For you the cloud shall clear the way, let my people go. A fire by night, a shade by day, let my people go. Go down, Moses, Let my people know. We need not always weep and moan. Let my people know. And wear the slavery chains for Lord. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. I think we need to give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Desert Corral and Robert Schultz, our soloist, and Brian Moon, our guitarist. Thank you. What will you take from this place today? Will it be the message, the music, the inspirational words? And will you, can you, leave a symbolic part of yourself? Now an offering will be collected to support the life and work of our congregation. 
If you're joining us on live stream, you can send a check to the office, give online at uuct.org forward slash donate, or text 833-361-5796. If you're here in person, the offering baskets are by the patio doors if you would like to put your offering there either now or on the way out. Thank you, Hanu. The words for our reading this morning come from Ayaya Winwood from a Facebook post of hers a few years ago. This is a longer reading, so settle in. A long time ago, I turned over a big rock and saw creatures I considered yucky scurrying from the light. They were slimy and many-legged and moved in ways that surprised and revolted me. I was five. Since then, I've learned that the slimy things were slugs, the many-legged were centipedes, and the yucky moving things were pill bugs. I didn't lim linger by the rock when I was five because I didn't understand what I was seeing. These days, collectively, we are turning over the old, tired boulders of white supremacy and patriarchy. What we are discovering is disturbing and revolting, and we are right to be repulsed by what we see. That said, it's time we stop being shocked. There is nothing natural about the ugliness of systemic oppression. And while we might be surprised by what's happening, it's important that we honor and retain our repugnance. Otherwise, it's easy to become complicit in it. Our old systems are in the process of disintegration and decay. They are literally falling apart in front of our eyes. Some of us will resist and stand guard, making sure that the rot and fallout are minimized. Some of us will provide hospice, ensuring that the systems die well and thoroughly. Some of us will tend to the victims and survivors. Some of us will design and create new paths 
to a common and integrated future. All are needed, and it's essential that each of us understands and embraces our particular part in all of it. It's also crucial that we support and hold up the efforts of those doing work that is different from ours. No one task is more or less important than any other. All of it is honorable and necessary. The cycle of birth, growth, decline, and death is a natural metaphor for what is happening on the global political stage. We are witnessing the death rattle of patriarchy and his handmaiden white supremacy. I suggest that rather than poke around in the gore and continually make ourselves sick from toxic exposure, we attend to our collective well being, remembering to care for each other and the earth and to make art and love as we resist mourn, heal, and build. We need every single one of us. Those who revolt, those who restore, those who dream and create the futures we're committed to. Let's refuse to be bamboozled or fascinated by the ongoing and seemingly relentless ugliness of oppression. Let's insist on remembering that we are all kin and that repairing the world is both our birthright and our responsibility. We can and will do this, for I have seen the future, and it includes all of us. These are holy, holy days. Today, Christians across the world are honoring Easter, the holy day when they remember the resurrection of Jesus, their Messiah, who was killed on the cross, rose from the dead a couple days later, promising to return again. Hallelujah, they can now say. And this week, Jews across the world are honoring Passover, that story in the book of Shemot or Exodus. The story that our prayer and anthems focused on this morning is of the Jewish people's escape from enslavement in Egypt. As the story goes, their God commands Moses to become a prophet for his people, guide the Jews out of Egypt on a journey to their homeland of Israel. These are holy, holy days. Both of these stories are the bedrock for Christians and Jewish people, respectively, in their faith. The stories shape the why of who they are as religious people, their respective theologies and beliefs. And the themes of salvation and freedom that are woven into these two sacred stories are related to what I believe is the why of Unitarian Universalism. But first, do we need a why? And how might this why be different from creeds, which we agree we are not bound by? In a lecture delivered in 2018 as part of a workshop at General Assembly titled Centering Theology, Conversations About Faith, Race, and Liberation, Dr. Elias Ortega said that, quote, we know what we do. We know how we do it. We need to work out clear, more clearly the why we do it. Why do we Unitarian Universalists do Unitarian Universalist things in Unitarian Universalist ways? My proposal is that one of our whys one of our reasons for being and doing is shared liberation. 
The idea that no one is truly free until everyone is truly free, and it will be through human work, human hands, not divine intervention, that we all get free. The idea of shared liberation is significantly different from the some of the tr- theological stories of our Christian and Jewish siblings and ancestors. We are not saved. We save each other. And we are not freed by God. We free each other. What would change for us if one of our whys, one of our purposes, was to get ourselves and one another truly free? How would our work together as congregations, as activists, as spiritual seekers change? In that same workshop and in the um, emailed order of service this morning, there are links to the videos. I would highly recommend you go watch all four. But in that same workshop where Dr. Ortega delivered his lecture, Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt delivered her own lecture. And in it, she shared an idea she heard preached by one of our Unitarian Universalist teenagers in 2017. In Dr. Betancourt's words, this youth, Paloma Kahlo, challenges us to become sanctuaries where telling our full stories and engaging with one another's healing alongside one another's pain can guide us to new ways of being. Paloma says that only when we come to bear witness to the cracked and shattered pieces can we begin to help heal what has been broken. With this inspiration, Reverend Dr. Betancourt challenges us to consider how something that is very familiar to us might be seen differently through the lens of liberation and being sanctuaries for each other. Remember before we hear Dr. Betancourt's words, that the flaming chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, was originally conceived to be worn on the uniforms of those seeking to help persecuted persons escape Nazi-controlled Europe during World War II. The symbol was a cup to give drink to others, and a flame coming out of that cup to represent a spirit of helpfulness and sacrifice. Reverend Dr. Betancourt invites us to consider this origin story and says, during World War II, the flaming chalice promised protection on the journey to freedom. What does this symbol offer to the liberation of those most driven to the margins of Unitarian Universalism today? Protection on the journey to freedom. The flaming chalice, which we use in services each week and at meetings throughout the week, is a physical sign of willingness to participate in the liberation of others, which is one reason we are who we are and do what we do. What does the liberating symbol of the chalice call us to do in these borderlands? where migrants traverse deadly terrain without access to food or water. Betsy cited numbers to put how many lost lives we've found in our head. What does the liberating symbol of the chalice call us to do as we see violence being waged in Ukraine and Palestine, Ethiopia and Yemen, Afghanistan still? What does the liberating symbol of the chalice call us to do when we encounter racism and oppressive mindsets and actions in ourselves, in our communities, and out in the world? Where in your life do you need to be claimed by the liberating power of the flaming chalice? And a reminder that liberation is not only for the oppressed, It is also for the oppressor, those with privilege, you might say. With that in mind, I'll ask again, where do you need to be claimed by the liberating power of the chalice? In his 1971 book, A Theology of Liberation, another thing, great thing to check out of the library if you don't, haven't read it yet. Uh, A Theology of Liberation by Gustavo Gutierrez defines a theology of liberation as that which, quote, frees the oppressed from their exploitation and marginalization and frees the oppressor from their isolation, their alienation, and their arrogance. Inspired by this theology of liberation, 
this is the third essay in that series I'll cite, Dr. Sharon Welsh in that lecture, uh, the part of that workshop, focuses on how white people can be liberated from white supremacy culture, thinking and actions. And though her focus here is on racism, her analysis I think could adapt to suit just about any oppressive system that one operates under. Dr. Sharon Welsh says, the theology of liberation frees whites from the isolation of not seeing and recognizing the scope and depth of racial violence. It also frees us from alienation, not seeing how our everyday systems and structures and practices maintain this violence. And it frees us from the arrogance of thinking that we have moved beyond the real threats of explicit and sadistic white violence against people of color. A theology of liberation also, also frees us to take accountability for this violence and to work in relationships of mutual accountability and respect. It's a lot to swallow, but all this to say, shared liberation, as Akaya Windwood said, will take all of us, all of us getting free from all that binds us, oppressed and oppressor, liberator and liberated, freed and freer. Akaya Windwood spoke earlier about how we are living in a time when old systems are being turned over. We are seeing that ugly underbelly. Windwood discourages us, and I love this, from poking around in the gore and continually making ourselves sick from toxic exposure. She asks us instead to attend to our collective well being. Windwood is clear that there is a space and a place for every single one of us in the work of overturning oppressive systems. She writes, those who resolve, those who restore, those who dream and create the futures we're committed to, we are all kin. And repairing the world is both our birthright and our responsibility. We can and will do this. I know, she continues, for I have seen the future, and it includes all of us. All of us is the vision of shared liberation. All of us. Living full and whole beings, able to be sanctuaries for each other, for the pain of the world, people who do and create and know why, and let that why guide their lives. What do you need to be free? What does your neighbor need from you to be free? What do you need from community to move together towards shared liberation? Friends, I know that the idea of getting free, of being free from all the oppressive systems of the world can feel really overwhelming today. And I believe is our most important task still. It is worth it to do one thing today to untangle ourselves from oppressive systems. Shared liberation is the goal, but we know we won't get there today or tomorrow, just as we know we won't get there alone. The path to shared liberation is packed with contradiction and backsliding and messiness that I also would rather not engage with. But the from the systems that bind them is too great an injustice to accept. And my freedom from the supremacies that guide my thoughts and actions is too great of an evil to continue. So bring on the contradiction and the backsliding and the messiness. Let us strive to be sanctuaries for each other. Let us remember that we get each other free. Let's know that we each have a role to play. The work is too important to ignore any longer. Let's make shared liberation the goal. Amen, blessed be, and may we make it so.
Thank you. It is good to have you back, choir members. <laughs> I'm going to have you all join me, whether you're here in person or joining us on YouTube. Join us in our responsive closing words. You will read the italicized lines with Betsy. If we will have, can we have those words up? For people at home, too. For people at home, too. If we will have the wisdom to survive, to stand like slow growing trees on a ruined place, renewing and enriching it. If we will make our seasons welcome here, asking not too much of earth or heaven. Then a long time after we are dead, the lives our lives prepare will live here. Their houses strongly placed upon the valley sides. Fields and gardens rich in the windows. The river will run clear as we will never know. Pause. Betsy, can you turn your mic on? On. We'll go. And over it, bird song like a canopy. On the levels of the hills will be green meadows, stock bells in noon shade. On the steeps where greed and ignorance cut down the old forest. An old forest will stand, its rich leaf fall drifting on its rock. The, rain, the veins of forgotten springs will have opened. Families will be singing in the fields. In their voices, they will hear a music risen out of the ground. They will take nothing from the ground. They will not return, whatever the grief at parting. Memory native to this valley will spread over it like a grove, and memory will grow into legend legend into song, song into sacrament. The abundance of this place, the songs of its people and its birds will be health 
and wisdom and indwelling light. This is no paradisal dream. Its hardship is its possibility. And will you now extinguish your chalices and candles at home with me as we say these words of chalice extinguishing from Reverend Maureen Killeran together? This is the message of our faith, to act with passion in the face of injustice, to love with courage in the midst of life's pain. This is the meaning of our chalice flame. May it empower our hearts until we are together again.